Another episode of Words of Grace starts now. Featuring a new grace-filled message each week as Acts 433 Church brings the gospel to you through the teaching ministry of Dr. Matthew Webster. This week is going to be a good one because the message doesn't fit, doesn't seem to fit with a normal series on discipleship. It's great to be with you all. You know, we tend to think of discipleship as an ongoing journey with helping another believer grow in their faith, and that, that's what it is. But did you know that discipleship can also be the way that someone becomes saved? Today's story seems to just reinforce the fact that salvation is a work of God. And it teaches that someone can be uh, saved as they are taught Scripture. You see, in our story, Philip, at this point where we're going to be at uh, today, we're going to find that a God-led opportunity led him down the least likely path, which led to the least likely person receiving salvation. Now, I've probably already given away too much, so let's get right to the text. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, Acts 8.1. This is an important verse, because if it had not been for the persecution, Philip would not have been in the proper place to proclaim the gospel to a man whose heart was ready to receive it. The trials and tribulations that we go through prepare us for gospel prosperity, which is people being saved. Why am I going through this pain, this trial, this suffering? You know that those things that we overcome through Jesus set us up for gospel success. Now verse 2 is shocking to the early church, uh, what they went through. Godly men buried Stephen, the text tells us, and mourned deeply for him. How could this be? There was a move of God. The Holy Spirit came down and filled the hearts of believers. Miracles were happening. And then we have the first Christian martyr. Now, the reality is set in that their mission is dangerous, and they'll be challenged by Satan. One way is through Saul. You know, the same guy who encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and wrote about half of the books that we have in the New Testament? But Saul, it tells us, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now, destroy the church is an interesting phrase that is used. It's not a proper translation. We know this because Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so a better translation here is that Paul is not destroying the church, but he's wreaking havoc on or ravishing the church. He isn't destroying it. The church isn't being destroyed or becoming weaker. Just the opposite. The persecution caused the spread, the movement, which was prophesied so that the gospel might spread. In Acts 1.8, it says, But you, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Spirit had already come, but God's people had yet to move out of Jerusalem. But now, because of persecution, there is movement. Now in enters the main character for our message, Philip. 
Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Well, of course there was. People were being healed. People were experiencing the salvation of the Lord. And so, why was Philip in Samaria? He's there because Saul wreaked havoc on the church in Jerusalem. So there in Samaria, Philip continued the work of the gospel. People are healed. There's great joy wherever he went. And as you continue to follow in Acts chapter 8, there's a sorcerer who even believes and is baptized. And the people who used to follow the sorcerer now believe the gospel. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. What good can come out of heading toward the desert? We can at times think, Lord, what sense does this make? Things are working out pretty well where I'm at. But if we'll follow his lead, we'll continue to experience miraculous things. Salvation for the lost. Even though towns were receiving the gospel, this desert move, logically, it just made no sense at all. But if Philip will follow the Lord's lead, the gospel will spread to an entire nation. Philip had no way of knowing or foreseeing what would transpire out of his obedience. Here we have divine direction, where to go, the desert road, without knowing the why. Can I get a witness from the church that often the way that God works in our lives is to lead us out to something before we even know the why. We just have a, a piece about it, a piece about choosing X over Y, accepting this job over that one, moving here or staying there. So there is obedience to move, and after he moves, the next step is revealed. This is how God works. And this is what works best for us to live by faith and to trust in him. Be obedient to what you do know. And then the why will eventually be revealed. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. We find this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. But in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, there would have been a problem. His race, Gentile, he's an Ethiopian, along with his physical deformity, a eunuch. Eunuch means, well, you'll have to Google that for yourself. I'll just stick with he had a physical deformity. And it would have kept him from approaching God in the Old Testament law. But in the New Covenant, God approached him. God, through Philip, sought him out in the desert, making it clear that this is the new covenant, where even a deformed Gentile can become a true saint and member of the family of God in Jesus Christ. Did you know that this moment in history between Philip and the eunuch is known as the Ethiopian prophecy being fulfilled? Whatever do you mean, Pastor Matt? Well, let me read it to you. Psalm 68, 31 says that princes, princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands 
unto God. And more significantly for our purposes in Isaiah 56, 4 through 5, it foresaw a time when eunuchs would be included among the people of God. It says, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that should not be that shall not be cut off. That's better than a double rainbow. We have a double prophecy being fulfilled at the same time. Verse 28 in Acts 8 says, And on his way home, was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet based later on in the text, we actually find out the exact scripture that the eunuch is reading. And it's, it's going to tell about the Messiah to come. And at this point in scripture, he had come. And he had, in fact, died for this man's sins. And so in verse 29, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. This is divine timing. He wants the eunuch to get to a certain place in Scripture, to have this curiosity and to be at a place in his life where he has questions, because God is sending him the answer. And so uh, here it is. Did you know that God still does this today? And you can be someone else's Philip in this story, revealing Jesus to them. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. You see, when you follow the Spirit's lead, you'll be right on time, and you will be ready to respond. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? Here is a beautiful picture of how to successfully share the gospel. The man is at a point in his life where he is seeking answers, he is open to things of God, and he will invite Philip to come up into his chariot with him and have a conversation about God. So he says, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? And this is the point at, at, at this moment that he would then invite Philip to come and sit with him. Now, this is the passage of Scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his hum humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So the eunuch is reading Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 through 8. The setup is so wonderful, because all Philip has to do is be ready to answer a simple question. The eunuch asks Philip, tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And I'll ask you, our Bible scholars out there. Who is Isaiah talking about? And here, I'll put it up on the next, uh, I'll put up the next verse on the screen, and you'll see who he's talking about. It says, Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. I don't know if there is a better verse in all the Bible that showcases sharing the good news about Jesus and the simplicity to it. Because the entire Bible is pointing us to Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the one who would die in our place, who would take our sins upon him, who rose on the third day, defeating not only sin, but also death. So for everyone who believes in him, they will be given everlasting life. 
The gospel can be shared in a variety of ways, but it is always about leading other people to the good news about Jesus. Acts 8.35 So in verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. And I guess, you know, the going along the desert road, maybe it was a little surprising. But he's got something in his mind and his, in his heart. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? So obviously somewhere in the sharing of the gospel, Philip must have mentioned baptism. And we learn here what the qualification of baptism is through this story. Now, some manuscripts, and, and in, in fact, if you're reading your Bible along with this message, there may be an asterisk that's there. Um, some manuscripts include the following that says that if you believe with all your heart, you may. And uh, the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so even if that part wasn't in the original, in all of the manuscripts, only in some of them, it doesn't matter. This text tells us very clearly that there is only one qualification for baptism. Believe in Jesus. You see that in Acts 2, 41, 8, 13, Acts 16, 14 through 15, 18, 8, 19, 4 through 5. There's a lot of places in Scripture it's confirmed. Unfortunately, throughout many centuries, believers have thought that baptism is reserved for pastors to baptize others. No. Anyone who's been baptized is qualified to baptize another person. And what I just said is scandalous to some, but it's biblical. You don't need a pastor or another religious leader if you lead someone to faith, and they say, hey, look, there's a lake over there. Could you baptize me? Sure, why not? Romans 6.3 tells us that when we are baptized, we are identifying with Christ and his crucifixion. When we come out of the water, we're saying, Christ has risen, and so have I. The old me no longer lives, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that's Galatians 2.20. The, the life that Christ offers is not an improved life, but a new life. The old you has gone, it has died, and you are a new creation given his life. During this time of intense persecution where they had to leave their homelands in Jerusalem and they were scattered all around, all around that Acts 8.1 tells us about. Baptism, when someone would make that decision, it said, I am not afraid of death because Jesus died on my behalf. And through his sacrificial death and resurrection, I can experience new life here and now. And then, so in verse 38b, then both Philip and the eunuch went down in the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again. But he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Adzotos and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached uh, Caesarea. God prepared Philip in Jerusalem for Samaria. He prepared him in Samaria for Gaza. God, why am I facing this trial in my life in my own hometown, in my own backyard, at my own home. God uses everything that we go through for our good and the good of others. Your Jerusalem hardship might be and probably is the very thing you need to lead you to the success that he's leading you forward in Samaria 
and then Gaza. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, which is Ashdod, in case you were wondering. Well, I don't think that helped anyone. Well, Ashdod, or Azotus, is a city in Israel on the Mediterranean coast. It's situated between Tel Aviv to the north, 20 miles away, and Ashkelon to the south, 12 miles away. And we have Jerusalem, 33 miles to the east. And so I tell you all of that, whether you are a geography buff or not, that what God supernaturally did is he made Philip appear 48 miles away from where he baptized the eunuch. Sometimes the quickest route to your next destination might appear to take you in the wrong direction first. But there's an important stop that needs to be made and watch what God will supernaturally do. I've come to realize that there are, will be times when you and I will lead someone to faith, and then we might not see them much more after that, as was the case with Philip and this man. I, I used to think a lot about strategies to grow your church and things like that, and it's not necessarily bad at all, especially when you do it with the right heart to see people saved and believers grow in, in their faith. And I used to be a little bummed out when I'd invest hours and hours uh, in someone else and, and in someone else's life and got to know their family really well, and then they wound up going to another church. But now I, I have little to no interest in growing my church. I'm interested in growing the kingdom. It's not my job to get people to join Acts 433 Church. It's my calling as it is yours to share the good news about Jesus like Philip did. If God leads them to church X, Y, or Z, as long as they are preaching the gospel, then praise God for that. The Spirit should lead them because God knows where they best can be used for the kingdom. This verse also gives us a little window into what the rapture will be like. It'll be very sudden, and then we'll all be gone, the believers in Christ, just like Philip was. I'm excited for the journey that God has in store for you. God will lead you down some unusual paths. I can testify to that in my life. Trust Him in the journey. And uh, take that simple next step of faith. Communicate with Him. And eventually the why, why am I going here? Why is this happening? Why, why, why? It'll eventually make sense. Be ready, church, to notice those who are open to receive the good news about Jesus Christ. You're equipped to do it because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And who knows, the next person you lead to faith in Christ may be the very next person that you yourself gets to baptize. I want to thank you for joining us. What a wonderful time it's been in the Word of God in Acts chapter 8 looking at how someone who was not even a believer had the scriptures uh, um, revealed, Jesus revealed in scripture to them, and they were saved and baptized that very same day. Incredible stuff, incredible that God would fulfill two prophecies at one time in the most unlikeliest place with the most unlikeliest guy so that the gospel would reach the country of Ethiopia. So let's go ahead and let's finish off our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, being able to break down this text. And I know this wasn't nearly as difficult a text to understand as a prophecy in the Old Testament, like the one that the eunuch had questions for. But I thank you that it shows that your timing is always right on. You had Philip wait, and then right at the right time when the guy had the question in his heart about the text, you moved Philip forward and he was able to reveal the good news about Jesus Christ. 
Lord, I thank you that that is what we are called to do. And I thank you that as we spend more and more time in your word, man, we're really empowered to go out and to do the very thing that Philip did. I thank you that we can be a Philip in someone else's world. You are working on people's hearts right now. People who are seeking, people who have questions, people who are longing for salvation. Lord, may we be willing to take that next step of faith, even when it might not make sense, because I know that in your heart, you wish that none will perish, that all will come to believe in your Son. And so, uh, I'm excited because you're going to do supernatural things through our listeners' lives. And, uh, and I get to be a small part of that, encouraging them in the faith, walking alongside them in this journey. And so we thank you for our time together. We look forward to our time next week uh, as we continue forward in our Making Disciples series together. All honor and glory is yours in Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.